the shuttle flight footage here, and then we'll jump into space news for the rest of the night. I hope you enjoyed Starfield. And I will see you guys in a short bit. Yeah. And Dan, you have the same you have the same stuff. It's what it did, it's terrible. I don't even know what I did. I don't I have no idea. I just a couple of days ago I was just like, wow, my back really hurts. And then yeah, it just got crippling over like the last two days. Yeah, I have no idea what happened. It's called getting old. I am doing that. Yeah. All right. Anyway, I'll be back momentarily. We'll keep. We'll get this thing get going here. I'm gonna go walk around, and grab a quick bite. I'll be back, dudes, and then we'll talk about what's going on in the space industry. Okie dokie. I'll see you in a second. Ribbed. Uh surfaces there inside the, the flame trench those are actually um, membranes to hold water and those will get burned away and you'll sort of see that in the film when the boosters fire and there you see them right there and there's water in there that's sort of uh, that's sort of getting jarred loose and turning into steam uh, and, I, and I'm assuming I don't know for sure that it, it prevents uh, sort of a recirculation of the exhaust at liftoff probably again acoustic deadening noise and there you see those boosters firing off. If you look in the upper uh, left-hand corner, you see the, um, uh, the umbilical uh, falling backwards there. And then look at how the uh, space shuttle main engines are punching through that, that, uh, that water in the flame trench. That's really cool. Yeah, that is, it is quite a dramatic shot. And the, uh, you can see the uh, auto exposure control on the, uh, on the lens, as we've talked about um, on some of the other views, really helping to be able to see the detail on the uh, the SSMEs uh, punching that hole, as well as looking at the plume from the for the from the SRB, um, and seeing the uh, the edge of the, uh, the belly of the orbiter too. You see the, the SSMEs aim a little bit off uh, kilt there, and you can see them hitting the uh, the upper part of the mobile launch platform as they rise off. Amazing that they capture all that detail in the S uh, the SRB plumes. It's good stuff. It's a fantastic clip, it, it, you know, yeah. it really is. This is a uh, camera Echo 41. This is on the fixed service structure on the FSS at the 255 foot level. It's a uh, 10 millimeter focal length on the 16 millimeter camera. It's a really interesting view. And you know, Matt, you wanna provide some more details about what we're seeing? Yeah, you can see the boosters have already fired in this big uh, umbilical structure that you see swinging back. Uh, it's actually very massive. The plate on the end of that is about a foot and a half by three foot uh, square. You'll see a close-up of that in a little bit. That's the um, the uh, ground umbilical to uh, hook up to the uh, the venting for the hydrogen tank, and, and it's got some uh, nitrogen and helium purge lines and some instrumentation to go with it. A pretty complicated structure. you get a picture of that in a minute. If you look at the MLP or the mobile launch platform, you'll see all the water coming out of the rainbirds under the launch pad. And again, our active uh, exposure uh, kicking in there and giving us a great shot of the plumes as the vehicle clears the tower. If you look on the right, you can just see a tad of the SSME uh, burning there, that little blue cone. Fantastic detail there, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great shot. Echo 40 is one of my, my favorite shots, Matt, and this is on the, uh, the fixed service structure on the FSS at the 275 foot level, just a bit higher than the two previous um, uh, views we, we saw. And this is uh, really an incredible view of uh, not only the orbiter, but the, uh, the beautiful ocean of late spring day in Florida and very nice lighting uh, on the tank and uh, as well as you'll see on the orbiter surfaces. Yeah, it truly is a magic hour on this. Uh, that orange tank, for those that aren't all that familiar with the shuttle, that's foam. That's insulating foam on the tank to keep the cryogenic propellants cold on the inside. Uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen are pretty chilly when they get into their liquid state. 
Uh, you can actually virtually look into the cockpit here. If you look carefully, you can see the ocean right through the window, just briefly there for a moment. Kind of fun. Uh, there's discovery in all its glory. This, this uh, engineering view is to look at uh, any possible issues with the tiles or the thermal protection system on the vehicle. And uh, look at that, absolutely gorgeous. You can see some of the flakes of ice sort of tracking the vehicle as it moves upwards. Remember, uh, as we mentioned earlier, that 3,000 pounds of water vapor a second is coming out of the uh, space shuttle main engines on the back. It's pretty incredible and it's virtually invisible. All right, this view is of, uh, of a structure we call the GUP, which is the uh, ground umbilical carrier plate, which attaches to the ground umbilical carrier assembly, sometimes called the GUCA. That plate is about a foot and a half by uh, three foot. It's a sizable plate. You don't really capture the scale in this, and you can see the vehicle is now lifted up and it's taking off. That umbilical peels back right at uh, solid rocket booster separation or uh, detonation. Hey Matt, this is uh, camera 33, and this is at, on the FSS. It's at the 235-foot uh, level, um, and is using a uh, fairly long uh, focal length lens. It's, uh, and you can tell by the field of view that it is a long focal length lens, and it's 75 millimeters. Now, if you look, you can see the booster's kind of surging. It's not a continuous uh, pass. It sort of pushes and then slows down a little bit. And what you're seeing there is the natural frequency of the booster thrust. Um, I believe it was on the order of about seven hertz, uh, seven cycles a second, and you can see that go by and hear the, uh, the aft skirt of the boosters going by with a really nice tight shot of the, uh, the exhaust. This camera view is uh, on the pad perimeter. It's located at camera site three. It's about 1,273 feet away from the uh, from the vehicle, and it's the first in a series of the 35 millimeter cameras, which we'll be seeing in the upcoming uh, sequences. Uh, there's a lens on here. The focal length is 500 millimeters or so, and the effective uh, exposure um, is a 1 450th of a second, and the camera's running at 180 frames per second. Yeah, it's a beautiful shot, and uh, this is going to, as uh, Kevin said, it's first in the 35 millimeter shots. They're a little better quality uh, because they've just got more surface area to put an image on. Um, you can see the SSMEs firing and uh, all in nominal operation here. And uh, as soon as they pull away from the pad, you'll see the left booster in the background uh, centered between the two service tail masts. And just a gorgeous uh, shot right there, looking at the steam coming off the SSMEs. And uh, this is a fantastic uh, capture of what, what remains behind after the vehicle clears the towers. You have all of this water and steam uh, being pushed around in this amazing uh, hostile acoustic environment. I mean, look at what's going on there. This is all acoustic noise and, and shock uh, coming from the boosters and the SSMEs. Camera 63 is uh, located on the pad perimeter. Uh, one of the camera sites. It's uh, 1,270 feet uh, from the vehicle and it's using a 105 millimeter lens. The uh, camera's running at 180 frames a second and that's pushing about 630 feet of film through the camera uh, per minute. Uh, quite, quite, a, quite a fast rate, uh, especially for 35 millimeter. Yeah, you can see the sparkers going there just getting ready to turn uh, the main engines on. And uh, in the background, you see the water tower. That's where all that fresh water comes from to flood the pad, to keep it chilled and deaden uh, a lot of that acoustic noise that we've already seen uh, what it looks like uh, in the plume. Uh, absolutely gorgeous day, really accentuated by this shot. Blue sky in the background. Goes great with the, uh, the white exhaust plume coming out there. And uh, you can see a lot of splashing and uh, stuff jetting out from all different directions at the bottom. You'll see more of that in the shots that are coming up. Uh, th this shot is going to be the first uh, of a, a bunch of different views as we march counterclockwise around the pad to look at it from different angles. 
and uh, there you can see the boosters have fired and you see it all coming out the other side of the flame trench and uh, beautiful shot of it coming off the pad and the lighting at uh, five o'clock in the afternoon on this uh, late spring day is just about perfect from this camera view of course it won't be perfect uh, from all the views but uh, certainly is a nice angle and really illuminates the, the vehicle as well as the structure very nicely. Yeah. yeah, I like when uh, when the vehicle leaves. Uh, I left a lot of these shots run long because I thought it was kind of neat to see what happens afterwards. And you can just see the, the whole service structure here being engulfed in steam and, and exhaust from the solid rocket motors. Now, one interesting thing about the 30, this particular 35 millimeter format is uh, earlier we mentioned about the time code. And the iRig time code is uh, burned in with an LED display. And on the 35 millimeter format, it's actually in part of the, the image area because the 35 millimeter format has uh, four sprockets per frame. Uh, so there's no way to position the, uh, the LED um, time code in between the sprockets like we can on the 16 millimeter right, views. Right, so, so if you looked at the, the 16 millimeter, you could actually see the, the sprockets at the top and the bottom of, of each frame, and those aren't visible in, in the 35 as you see here. The, uh, the camera number uh, is on the lower right hand, uh, on the lower right hand display of the LED time code, and it's, uh, in this case, it's camera number 62. So the, uh, the 35 millimeter format also allows us to put a a, de a camera designator number that's uh, fairly often used uh, just to help for uh, viewing purposes and, and tracking purposes. This again is a 105 millimeter lens um, and is on the pad perimeter approximately 1270 feet um, from, the, uh, from the vehicle. Look at, look at the, the, uh, the, the absolute force that all of this stuff is coming out of there. I, I've talked uh, earlier in the piece about how much is coming out of the solid rocket boosters, 20,000 pounds uh, combined, and then the uh, SSMEs are losing 3,000 pounds of uh, liquid propellants a second. And that really shows up here when you're looking underneath the, the launch platform. You can see uh, that all of that stuff doesn't have anywhere to go, which is why it's vectored out on both sides uh, so it can be uh, sort of safely directed away from the vehicle so there's no uh, rebounding or sort of backflow so to speak. And one thing we haven't had a chance to talk about uh, earlier is the uh, how the cameras are triggered. Uh, currently the, um, the cameras all triggered using the uh, POX or the photo optical control system which triggers all the cameras on the pad perimeter on the uh, fixed service structure as well as the, uh, the MLP and uh, it's quite a sophisticated system um, to synchronize and, and trigger all the cameras uh, based on the launch clock. Yeah, it's undoubtedly uh, a very complex system to have all these cameras operate uh, flawlessly for each launch. They're very important, if not critical, for, for shuttle launches, and um, it's an amazing achievement that uh, all the men and women who, who work on this are able to uh, do it uh, with such a degree of reliability every launch. Um, another shot here is, as I said, moving around counterclockwise, you see the SSMEs or the boosters are just firing, excuse me, and there you see the, the gup falling back as we talked about earlier, the uh, umbilical uh, assembly. This view is using the same 105 millimeter focal length uh, lens that the, uh, the other two views we just uh, looked at, and again is about 1200 feet from the, uh, from the vehicles where the camera site is located. You know, th this was a really unusual day because you just mentioned earlier that, you know, from not all, from all views is the lighting going to be as good, but this is about as good as it gets. I mean, each and every one of these camera views is well exposed, uh, both from an engineering and a beauty standpoint. Uh, they're all very, very nice shots. And it's why we selected 124 uh, to be the predominant content in this movie. There's the, uh, the uh, water tower, by the way, in the foreground. It's just about to get engulfed with the exhaust this is a uh, dog 68 it's a uh, 35 millimeter camera and it's really uh, uh, intended to be a documentary camera so it's running at uh, 28 uh, frames per second uh, not really a high-speed camera so it's, it's almost real-time a real-time camera view it's a just a really beautiful shot and uh, because it's a documentary camera, we're able to uh, uh, enlarge the aperture so that the timing block isn't taking up image area. 
and present it in its uh, widescreen view, and I think it's quite dramatic. Yeah, from a from a beauty standpoint, um, this is probably at the top of my list for favorites. Uh, um, it's just gorgeous quality, uh, fantastic color saturation, and um, very unusual for uh, shuttle photography to be so beautiful uh, at the same time. So Echo 55 begins our series of uh, tracking cameras. Um, Echo 55 is mounted on a Kineto tracking mount, or KTM, which we uh, commonly refer to it as. And it's uh, located at CS1, about 1,200 feet uh, from the vehicle. This is a nice shot because you can see uh, there's a bit of a distortion cloud here that we're shooting through. And what that is, is hydrogen being burned off um, from the fueling system. They, they burn off any excess hydrogen uh, to safely combust it. So that's what we're seeing here, and it's really gorgeous as the vehicle sort of comes out of that and goes into its roll program, uh, clearing the tower. Uh, again, just a fantastically uh, well-lit photograph on this, on this day. Some of the white things that you see falling off there are paper covers, which protect some of the uh, order maneuvering system engines. We'll talk about those later. But Kevin, the, the, these are all manually operated, right? I mean, there are human beings behind the scenes um, doing this tracking now. Yes, this uh, uh, KTM, or the Kinetto tracking now, has about four cameras uh, that are mounted on it. And this particular uh, camera, Echo 55, is one of a pair of cameras um, and is intended to look at the uh, top half of the vehicle as well. What are these numbers on the side, Victory? Um, it's the time code. It's an RXB time code. It's in UTC. Um, so uh, 2102. 21, 21st hour, 2 minute, 28 seconds, tenths, hundredths. I forget what, I think, I think this is for, that's the camera, I think. Um, this is used for synchronizing the engineering camera. So if you like saw something on an engineering camera, right? And you like kind of see something like behind, you can look at another camera and you could sync the footage really, really easily because they all have the time code right on the film. It's the camera number? Yeah, that's that's what I thought. This is, yeah, 55. Oh. Okay. Sawyer is working on a video about this. We're talking to one of the guys who ran the Q, QVIS system. Really? Well, that's pretty neat. Tiny Victory says hi. Hello, Tiny Victory. Hey, Doc. This is this is a, a fantastic. Now they're completely uh, done with their roll program. And, Dude, uh, I could watch this all day. I yeah, love the space uh, shuttle. Intent of that uh, camera shot is only for the first 1,200 feet uh, of the ascent. Is uh, really the, uh, the the intention of that uh, that view, and that takes about uh, 18 to 20 seconds, I believe. Okay. Now this is camera 52. And this, of course, is at the bottom of the stack now, so it's a little different view, and uh, but part of a camera pair again. Right. This is this camera is uh, Yeet. as you said is 52, and this is located on uh, camera site uh, two, oh. and it's about the same distance, uh, 1,200 feet, uh, 1,270 feet from the vehicle. Nice shot. Of the nothing will be as there. cool as this. Maybe, maybe, well, maybe Starship. It, it always amazes me. Maybe Starship, but nothing. That dude. Exhaust coming out of the SSMEs is. Now this uh, Kineto tracking mount is uh, is controlled by an operator. That's freaking sweet. Operator, uh, who's sitting in the LCC on the second floor, uh, below the firing room. Those pieces coming off are um, are normal. What they do is they take like a an inflatable bag and they put them they put the inflatable bags in the RCS holes as uh, uh, barrel plugs to prevent FOD from going inside of like the rocket motors and stuff. Well, when I say rocket motors, I mean the little tiny thrusters that are on the shuttle, the, the reaction control systems. Those bags come out when the pressure drops, right? When the pressure drops enough, the vacuum will suck them right out. And uh, the person See? he or she is That's using the that is to uh, track um, the, the vehicle. And it's, uh, it's pretty tricky because they're just looking at a little video monitor. It's also quite interesting with the camera that it doesn't really look like the shuttle engines are lit. Well... Yeah, uh, the shuttle engine exhaust should be completely transparent. That's how you know the rocket engine is nice and healthy. 
And the reason why is because all that should be coming out of that thing is water vapor. Think about it. You have liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. You have H2 and O2. Take H2 and O2, put them through a combustion process. So atomize them, put them through a combustion process. The byproduct is, well, you get some H and some O, right? And the, all the H's and O's come out and come out of the engine and they actually... Hydrogen doesn't like to be kind of by itself. It'll go and like magnetize to another hydrogen and make H2 and then if it's H2 the O will find its way onto it and water comes out. Seriously, it's just it's just water vapor coming out the back. It's a big steam engine. It's not. It's a it's a liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen fuel rich stage combustion cycle. But that's the gist of it. Would be so fun to work with solid mo rocket and motors at NASA. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting juxtaposition because that is about as f efficient as you can get for a rocket engine, dude. The shuttle engines are still, to this day, one of the most efficient chemical rockets we have, if not the. They, they're only bested by the RL-10. And you have, the, you have that, and then you have this right next to it, which is one of the most inefficient freaking things that we have. <laughs> but what it lacks in efficiency, it makes up for in sheer amounts of things. Frick you thrust. That's what an SRB is for. Very, 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 very high thrust to weight. Lots of power, not very efficient. There's all kinds of unburnt fun coming out of the back of this. I don't know if you could tell. Frick you thrust. How fast do you want to go? Frick you. That's how fast I want to go. Yeah, oh, okay. And uh, the vehicle is moving much faster in real time. Oh. We're seeing, we're seeing Look at the gimbal on the right you know, SRB. Speed. See how it's kind of up? And when it when it turns so up, the whole the vehicle time. rolls. Oh, oh that's freaking killer! I love this thing, dude. We're flying it. We're flying it in Kerbal tomorrow. I gotta. We're gonna we're gonna put the shuttle through its paces again. We're, we're gonna get the shuttle missions going again. I I'm, I'm doing it. Analysis. This is done while the film is getting processed and transferred. How did they make such a giant grains? Shot, um, seeing you mean the giant grains right between the two plumes, and in fact, it gives you an idea how bright these plumes are to the naked eye because uh, the sun, as it passed through there, wasn't much yes. brighter than, than, than the plumes that you saw. Wonderful shot showing the column of fire that the vehicle rises on, and it, it really contrasts nicely with the blue. Dude, that thing highlighting is so cool. why ST One of my favorite parts of this is that you see the plume from the shuttle motors interacting with the outer plume of the SRBs, and you see some turbulent SRB exhaust right, right here where the engines are, where the plumes are expanding enough, because they're both cones. The plumes coming out of the rocket engines are both cones, and as you get higher and higher, the cones get bigger and bigger, and the engines, the the, the cone from the engine exhaust, from the main engine exhaust and the SRB exhaust, they they eventually cross. And when they do, it creates a lot of turbulent air right here. TS you can see it, right? Was, was see really it right there? Mission to, to sort of see it kind of off poofing the off the side? Beautiful it's thing. really cool. It's one of the coolest parts. Everything is cool. The whole thing is the coolest part. Let's be real. This is uh, camera 57. This is at uh, CS6. Uh, again, 1,200 feet from the pad or so. Yeah, an RDE you know, would be really, really, really cool, man. The vehicle. As I mentioned earlier, the, the camera is mounted on a tracker. ATM tracker has uh, four or five Damn, that thing is cool. different cameras on. I'm there. sorry, this nothing. Lower half. I, I know people are going to give me crap for this. Nothing will be as cool as the shuttle until Starship can do exactly what the shuttle can do. Nothing will be as cool. It is one of it is dude. It is god tier, S tier launch vehicle. Uh, uh, film camera. So freaking good. What a chadliest of the chadly design. Come off the, uh, RCS right, it man? Yeah, dude. Tyvek covers. People that made the XB70 made that. Material, come on. Put on come, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. These covers are there in case they get a squall or a little <laughs> storm while the shuttle's out on the pad. Not uncommon in Florida. And we can't afford to have water inside those engines, so we put those paper covers on there, and they have these little parafoils that inflate, sort of tear the cover off. They're just uh, adhered uh, with an adhesive of some kind. So the, uh, you'll see a lot of that white paper coming off Dude. of those launch shots. 
Beautiful shot looking up the tail end of the uh, oh. stack. And uh, look at it slide, man! You got to be kidding me! The deleted scenes on this disc. Who the hell thought of this thing? To, uh, edit a Whew. piece together showing this the camera pair, the views from the camera pairs pieced together. This should look pretty nice. Aromat ad time. All right, you're gonna get, you're gonna get some ad time. Feature on the disc. What if someone like Don makes a HTOL uh, space plane. That will be uh, cool, Aqualux, but I'm not so entirely really sure it's going to be as, as cool as the shuttle. Uh, tracking camera. Um, the, the mount and the camera are located at uh, UCS 4, which is about 2.4 miles uh, north of the pad. One of the reasons I selected this shot uh, to oh. be included on the DVD is because um, I thought it was really striking and really beautiful how, in their role program, as they went into their role, the, the sun sort of peaks over like it does here, and, and you can see the name pop out, and uh, slowly the whole orbiter becomes lit with the uh, with the evening sun. What a nice and, uh, shot the that is! Are fantastic here. You can see the thermal blankets. You can see some of the thermal uh, exposure to the thermal blankets. You see some variation in color, and you can see the tiles literally make out the uh, the boundaries of the tiles there. So uh, really a wonderful. Uh, piece of footage in, in. How do they put propellant into the solid rocket motor is what I mean. What did I say that was confusing? Bigger grains is not a thing, RJ. You know, oh, how do they do bigger grains? No, 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 no. Grain is just the name of the fuel. What you said is how do they make bigger fuel? That, that, no. No, 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 no. It, the SRBs are in casings, okay? So on the shuttle, you had a four segment. On SLS, you have a five segment. Casings are... This, the seams on the casings are right there. See, the, see, that's a, that's a casing seam right there, and then that's the front of that's the front of the casing. So that's one casing between here and right here. That's another casing. That's the second. So this is the front, front mid, aft mid, and then aft is down at the bottom. Aft is the one with the with the throat on it, right? Each each one of the, and in between are the O rings, the, those O rings that everybody knows about, right? Yes, those O rings. So they basically have a segment, right? And they put the segment on a pedestal. They they break down the into four segments. They put the segments on a pedestal and they literally pour the grain in. When you mix SRB propellant, it has the consistency of like Play-Doh, like watery Play-Doh, and they actually pour it in like concrete. And then it cures like concrete. And then after that, they put inhibitors on both sides to make sure that it accidentally doesn't go off. Yeah, I mean, amongst other things, the inhibitors are there for other reasons, but. Uh, and then they pick the segment up, cap each end, put it on a train car and send it to Florida. It's the forbidden cookie dough. Yep, yep. There, yeah, there are videos I can I can show you. A remarkable contribution to the DVD. And then, yeah, do not hump. Do not hump. The lens that's on the camera is a 150-inch uh, sheer lens. It's a cat eye diopter what a beast. Uh, lens, uh, so it's got a mirror surface. And it's about 4,000 mm. They, they pour grain into the casings like concrete, dude. That's the long story short. Here we could uh, we could pop over it. Creepers video here. That's the one I probably would have just looked up. Here, check this out. So watch. It's the forbidden Play-Doh. Watch this. So they're machining the nozzle right there. The nozzles on the space shuttles and SLS's SRBs are ablative. It's the only way to keep them cool is to literally make them burn off. That's solid rocket grain right there. That's the outer insulation for the SRV and so that is the inverted cast. That's what the thrust that's what the um um the combustion chamber looks like in one of the segments. The they're going to put they're going to put the um well, they call it a forward core, but that's the in, that's the invert. They're going to put that in the casing, pour the SRB grain around it, and then they'll pull the casing out. See? There you go. 
like I said, forbidden cookie dough. And then they pour it in. It, it, it actually looks like concrete, right? Yeah, see? So this is the inhibitor right here. I mean, did you see you see the consistency change there? After the SRB had been cast for a little while, they like were shaving it off before they were scooping it up. It it casts, you cast it, it like like concrete or modeling clay or something. So that's the inhibitor. That's the thing to make sure that you don't oopsie it. Now they're pulling the fins out. That, see right there, that's an aft segment. So like I said, on the shuttle, there were there are four segments on the boosters. There's the front, there's the front mid, there's the aft mid, and then there's the aft. That's an aft one because you can see that the casing tapers at the end. And like I said, in between, in between each four or five on SLS of the casings are the O-rings, the SRB O-rings. Now, just in case anybody's wondering, why make them in segments? Why not just make one big SRB? Um, weight? Weight? Yeah. Uh, see that thing right there? That uh, weighs as, probably as much as like five or six Abrams tanks. Yeah, casting the entire SRB as one segment would be um, hard to move around. Yeah. That's why, they, that's why they came up with using segmented boosters instead. They're easier to transport. A match probably wouldn't make it go off. You'd need a bigger explosion. Um, cause you gotta, with solid rocket propellant, you gotta heat it. You gotta heat it up first. Um, once some of the grain gets to a certain temperature, that's when it'll start combusting off. The igniters aren't, I've described the igniters on an SRB as like a big spark plug on the top it's not a spark plug it's a spark there's a tiny little igniter in there but the spark plug ignites an srb that's probably about this big and that srb shoots its exhaust it's called an srb igniter it shoots its exhaust into the grain and that's what gets the srb to go so you have a spark plug hitting an srb which lights the big srb yeah, that's that's how they do it. You you have to warm the propellant up. You have to get the propellant to a certain heat or else it won't auto combust. Discovery, go at throttle up. Deepak, shut up and take my money for three years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see there's your inhibitor and there's the casing. That's an aft casing right there, RJ. Yeah. So what they're going to do here is they're going to x-ray it because any air bubbles in this thing, you're going to have a bad day. Now, don't get me wrong. There's, there's going to be some air bubbles in there, but like a big cavity of air or air that got trapped in there, not good. That's going to give, that's going to give you not um, uniform combustion. And the SRB could perform in a way that you don't want it to. So there's your igniters right there. And then that's what happens when the igniter, the spark plug hits the igniter and the igniter hits the SRV off. That's what happens. Does that make sense? So, RJ, you know, like, how do they make the bigger grain? No, no, that's not the right question. It's just a bigger casing. They use the same grain. Believe it or not, like, that's the same kind of stuff that's in, like, a missile. Like a, a Sidewinder missile. It's it's all HTPB. Hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene. It's just big. The, the casing's a little bit bigger than a missile. I wasn't able to attend a mix session last year, but I put, I put a motor together. Let me look. Let me look back on what we did. I can likely find pictures that explain it, but we make different segments and then put them into the motor casing. We coat them in a type of epoxy, I believe. I get it now. Okay. Cool. Do they bolt the segments together? Yes, Builder. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, think of it like, you know, you have pipes, like, like heavy industrial pipe has a flange, 
right? And you bolt the flange together. It's it's like that. Yeah, pretty much pretty much the same. But there there's a clevis on the end. So on the end of one segment, you have a clevis and the clevis is like a like if this is the outside of the pipe right here, there's like a an insert that goes like this. And when you put it on another one, that clevis get, will put in, will, will actually like insert itself into the next segment. And then when you bolt it together, together it bolts, it, it holds that clevis in place. That clevis is what holds the O-rings, the, those O-rings. Yes, the, the ones that didn't work because they didn't use a clevis during Challenger. Here, I, I can show you. So, here. Discovery, go and throttle up. So this is what it. This is what the old design looked like. Um, so you have your double O rings, right? But see, see how the how this kind of clamps together. See this thing were between the inhibitor and the insulation in the zinc chromate putty right there on the on the seam you see that this this part basically the way this all kind of goes together it ends up uh actually that's not that's the three o ring design but with two o rings that's very strange that's not exactly what i'm looking for um Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, no, that's right. So, see where the zinc chromate putty is? Basically, because this is, like, curved like that, the way they did the insulators between the flanges, it, in certain conditions, in cold conditions, right, with Challenger uh, and any double O-ring SRB, see the two rings right there? Uh, combustion gases kind of got stuck right here and ended up shooting, shooting themselves up through the seam, which is... Not very smart, because see where the inhibitor is right there? The gases are all going this way, right? So when you got to a certain point, right, this where, the, where that inhibitor is, it bends down. And it actually, it makes the whole clevis want to go that way. So, like, if it goes together like this, it actually makes it want to do that. See what I'm saying? It makes it want to open up, because the combustion gases go through where the zinc chromate putty is. That's that that right there was not a good idea. Um, that was a really strange way to do that. I mean, obviously we have the benefit of hindsight, right? But see see how this is all set up? Like gases get stuck here, right? And they push down on where it says E. That thing bends down and it opens the damn clevis up and it exposes the stupid O-rings. Basically, the, the SRB uh, the SRB combustion gases obliterate the putty, and it exposes the O-rings directly to the gases. That was that that was a, that was not a smart idea. <laughs> that, that was not a that was not a good idea. You don't you don't really you don't really want that. Uh, um, <clears throat> so check this out when when they switched to the triple O-ring design. So post challenger, right? Right here. Check it out. On that clevis, they put they put the curve piece on top so the combustion gases go around it and they actually instead of forcing the clevis open, they force it closed and it pinches the o-rings during ignition so it never leaks. See 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 what I'm talking about? Instead of trying to open up the zinc chromate putty and the the clevis right there, instead of making it Instead of making it do that, right, it forces it closed. Like, there are more technical ways of explaining this, but basically this design after the after Challenger with the SRBO rings when the segments went together, this design forces, it, it sandwiches the clevises with SRB combustion gases and basically closes the O-rings so that it's never going to leak. Not even in cold. It's never going to do it. Physics would have to stop working correctly to get this thing to not seal. 
unlike this one where if you look see see the top like if the clevis is like this you see the taller part right there that's connected to the inhibitor and it actually opens it up Stu that not i mean that would be fine i guess uh but the problem with that is that you're exposing the O-rings directly to SRB gases. And if it's cold, the O-rings won't, they, they won't expand and it just blows right through it. That's what happened. But yeah, that's how they put the casings together. It's a flan, it, it's a flanged clevis. That's what it's called. The O-rings don't o-ring if you do that there you go that's a yeah there you go that's a good way to say that see like that that was the double o-ring design it basically opens up the stupid thing it's not that's not not really not really smart right there the inhibitors go on either side builder yeah that the inhibitors are there to there are, uh, I forget, I forget what the other reason the inhibitor there, but the name implies that it's there to stop it from combusting. Um, the inhibitor, I know the inhibitor is there for transport purposes, but I forget the other reason. There's another reason. It, it, it has to do with some, with how the SRB fires when it goes off, but I, I forget. Hey, Dak, what's going on? It inhibits something. I know it's for transport, but there is another reason. Anyway, yeah, RJ, good question, dude. Good question. I just, I didn't understand exactly what you were saying. Like, bigger grain is not, yeah, don't, I don't know who told you that. I've never heard anybody say that before. So, just on a side note. Um, all right, so, I'm going to transfer over the rest of these Space News links, and we'll see what we got here. Oh, yeah, welcome to Space News, by the way. This this is the segment where I teach people about teach people about and inform people about what's going on in the spaceflight industry right now. The SRB O-rings are fine. They've been fine since 1988 when they re when they re revised them. They were they, they were great on SLS, just putting it out there. That triple O-ring design with the the upper flanged clevis being or the upper clevis being like kind of out like this instead of the lower one being out like that. That's way smarter. If they, dude, if they had made that from the start, man, can you imagine? Imagine where the shuttle would be. We'd be <laughs> freaking shuttle would be building skyscrapers up in space. Did you see Rocket Lab's intentional S two pop? What like this? Whoops. Well, that's not a oopsie. They did that on purpose. So this is a tank, this is what's called a tank proofing test. Basically, this is a fuel tank that will, a fuel tank design that will go on a future rocket. That fuel tank isn't going on any rocket anytime soon. Let me put it to you like that. And they'll basically pressurize it to a certain pressure to see if it holds that pressure for a certain period of time. If it can, that means it, that criteria will basically mean that the tank will be able to handle all different types of load during a rocket launch. Lots of math gets done to figure out where to where to um, hold the tank pressure at for for X amount of time, right? Second part of this is that once it once it does that test, you push it to the absolute maximum to see to do some what's called FEA finite element analysis. Push it to the maximum and see where it pops, and that's what this test is. So these new carbon fibers. SR, SRB rockets won't have any O-rings, right? What? No, absolutely. No, of course they will. What are you, nuts? Hey, Natch. Dude, I met one of the medical crew on the shuttle. He's a captain now in your airline. What an interesting dude. Word. That's awesome. That's freaking cool, dude. Yeah. Did he tell you how absolutely Chad tier this shuttle is, and how S tier it is, and how it's an awesome vehicle, and we shouldn't shouldn't have stopped flying it? Hey, I don't care. It's twelve years on. I still don't care. I'm not. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I am going to beat that into the ground until we have similar capability. 
What did I just watch? Oh, you watched the tank pop. Looks like locks and liquid nitrogen. Uh, why would you do that? It is, and he did, and I agree with you. Nice. <laughs> bueno. <laughs> uh, bueno. The math behind picking the pressure isn't too complicated. That's actually, yeah, Sumo, that's right. It's the, That's actually one of the simpler parts of this, getting tank tank designs to work. <laughs> Methane, explodey, it's all nitrogen, Aerodite. It's all nitrogen. Why would you complicate things by putting oxygen in there? Nitrogen is a good enough analog, and you don't really put locks in there unless you want some type of explosion. Fiery explosion, not pressure explosion. It's, it's all nitrogen, because it's one tank, dude. It's just one tank. Cool. As part of structural testing, we're pushing our tanks to maximum expected operating pressure. Meop. And far beyond. See? It's always fun to round out an intensive test campaign with a bang. Cool. Yeah, see, one single, there's one single line going up into there. They're, they're filling it with liquid nitrogen. And see, they have these pipes hooked up where the from the vent line and the fill line right there. I'm not sure why they're filling in the mid-tank, though. That actually might be two tanks, dude. You might be right. I thought it was one, but the way the, way the ice is, the way the ice is um, accumulating on it, it might be two. But I don't see why they wouldn't fill both tanks with nitrogen. It looks like the fill and drain for the lower tank is over there, and the fill and drain for the upper tank is up there. So, but I still, why would you use locks? Nitrogen is a good enough analog to emulate what liquid oxygen is going to do. It's good enough. And they clearly top, they clearly tank the upper tank first, and then look, watch if this, that line, it, 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 the the upper. Hang on. Let me look at this. Let me look at the plumbing. There's a valve right there. See the valve? And then the valve goes down and the pipe goes in. If this pipe frosts over, that means they're, yeah, that means they're filling up with liquid nitrogen. But see, it's one line. It's one frosty line going up. So watch. That valve will open and this pipe will frost over. See? Cool, huh? I presume the engine down there is a dummy. I don't even think there's an engine down there, Jam. I think it's just the thrust structure from one with the fill and drain lines. Yeah, see, there's one pipe going up here, and the pipe's already frosty up there. That's got to be a vent or something. But see, when that valve opens, that pipe frosts up and it starts filling the lower tank. I'm not sure why they would tank upper first, but... Hmm. Structural? Aerodite, my guess would be that the, if they're gonna fill methane, up first and then liquid oxygen up first. I mean, nitrogen can approximate liquid methane and liquid oxygen, right? But yeah, I was wrong. That definitely is two tanks. It's not one. It's definitely two. I can just tell by looking at the plumbing on the side. It's made of carbon fiber. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool, man. So that's what Rocket Lab's up to. Neutron is Rocket Lab's uh, medium to light to medium duty rocket that they're going to scale up to. It's going to have a reusable first stage with a fairing attached to the top of the first stage. Yeah, weird, right? 
and inside of the fairing, the second stage is actually going to be hanging. And when the first stage fairing opens up, it deploys the second stage, the fairing will close, and then the first stage will boost back and land, which is actually really freaking cool. It's a really neutron's a really cool idea. I really I really hope really hope they they see it through. It's going to be awesome. And then that's them pushing that test tank to the absolute limits. Okay. Aerodite another another thing real quick. The tank pops. But they're only using nitrogen. Another dead giveaway here is all the fuel tanks. See all the fuel tanks? You wouldn't store liquid methane next to liquid oxygen. You wouldn't store liquid oxygen next to liquid nitrogen. Because if they bleed out, if they bleed off, the gas bleed, if they turn to gas and they bleed off out of there, it's going to make nitrous. Which, no. <laughs> nitrous, the, the, the go fast button in, on cars, the, the, the go fast button, the go baby go button, you don't want that. They wouldn't put them all together like that. And I don't see any other plumbing around, so it's, it's all nitrogen. Always has been. Yeah, you said duty. Mute the video. What's this? Yep. Yeah, Chinooks can float. They can float. Oh, yeah. Now, oh, where's Bright Shiny when I need him? <laughs> yeah, Chinooks can float. Yeah, they absolutely can. Yeah, you, they can land on water. You can drive a rib right up in them. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. These CH 47s can float. They can just. The pontoons on the side, dude. The birdie is taking a bird bath. <laughs> yeah. You want to know how I learned Chinooks can float? You want to know how I learned that? Playing Battlefield Vietnam. Because in BFV, back in the day, they float in that game too. And I was like, what the hell? Why is this floating? What a stupid game glitch. And then I went and looked it up. And I was like, oh. That They float. All right. Uh, weather guy, I'm a taxpayer. I can pronounce it however the heck I want to. Chinook. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the co-pilot speaking, and... Uh they're also my controls, and despite what the captain says, I can touch them if I want to. BFE, pass the Geritol. Dude, screw, screw you, man. <laughs> this is a good game. <laughs> you shut up. Forge, what do you, what do you want to bring up? Sorry for bringing up this subject again, but I don't know how NASA contracting works in the case of commercial low-Earth orbit development. In NASA's statement, they said Northrop Grumman has quit the commercial low-Earth orbit development program and got paid $34 million out of their $89 million that they... What? Payment was done on the basis of making a preliminary design review, and now after the program is canned, will they reimburse NASA or what? Uh... I'm not sure I'd have to look at the I'd have to look at the um, the solicitation for Cleod. NASA partners combine efforts for low Earth orbit commercial station. So the kind of controversial news that's going out out and about right now is centered around a uh, a program that's still kind of in its infancy right now called NASA's Commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations Program or Cleod for short.
Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, it, it's it's based off of the contract. I'd have to go look at the. I'd have to go look at the Cleod. Um, I'd have to go look at the contract. It should be public. We should be able to find it. But basically, what's going on is. You know, NASA said, "Hey, we want to we want to make commercial space stations after the ISS is done." And a bunch of private contractors like Blue Origin, a bunch of defense companies replied, and "said You know, like Blue said, okay, we'll make a space station." And Sierra Space said, "Okay, we're going to partner with Blue to make a space station." And Northrop Grumman said, "Okay, we're going to make a space station." And uh, um, other NanoRack said, "We're going to make a space station," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but the, the big controversial news is that Northrop Grumman decided that all, uh, all of a sudden they decided that the market for commercial low Earth orbit space, space stations wasn't enough to go at it by themselves. And they, they actually merged with another competitor to the contract, not merge the company, merge the programs with another competitor uh, to make a commercial space station. They partnered with, an, with one of the other people, with one of, with, uh, who was it? Voyager Space and NanoRacks. Um, and it's interesting because Northrop Grumman did it basically citing that they don't think that there's going to be that much of a market for commercial low Earth orbit stuff. Not enough to go at it by themselves. Which... Uh, I'm not sure how to feel about that. I, I will say that... I. <laughs> I think that NASA should have a replacement to the ISS, but it shouldn't be the ISS. We don't, don't, we don't, first of all, we don't have a space shuttle to build another one. Second of all, if we do build another one, say Starship gets up and running, it should not be an ISS clone. The modular space station, putting together, putting together a modular space station like that was basically to show when you make something like how the ISS is put together, basically a shuttle goes up there and it assembles each part one by one. When you do something like that, it really only makes sense if the shuttle is flying a lot, and the shuttle did not fly a lot, so it ended up being really expensive. It ended up being the most expensive way to make a space station with probably the most expensive launch vehicle that you could think of to build a low Earth orbit space station. So if NASA has a, like a Mark II space station, right, that they make after the ISS, I, I think they should, first of all, because that is a solid anchor point, you know, but it should be more like Skylab, more like Skylab, more like the Soviet Salyut program, which is the Russian word for salute. Um, basically small, sm a small space station that you don't need to maintain. It stays up there for a little bit of time and then dump it and then launch another one. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they do Oculus, but I'd have to check. I'm not 100% sure, and I didn't want to guess. The TLDR of what's happening: Orbital Reef had a breakup. SNC, you don't know that for sure. Forge. SNC is looking to do their own thing with an inflatable hab. Blue is sending the program into the back rooms for the time being. Northrop Grumman, as you said, is joining forces with Voyager. Starliner, meanwhile, since Orbital Reef is can, they're can too for the 2030 pluses. But that what you just said is entirely based off of a predication. Uh, and Blue basically posted yesterday that they're committed to doing Orbital Reef and committed to CLD Phase 2. So all that hubbub that we heard... All that hubbub that we heard about what's going on with Sierra and Blue is, and that Orbital Reef is not a thing anymore is, is bullcrap. That's... I don't. It's, we didn't get the whole story there, so somebody ran a headline off of, you know, fragmented information, and then filled in the blanks themselves, which I hate when people do that. But it is what it is. So yeah, I mean, it it does bring into it does. Now here, I'm gonna do the same stupid thing, and I'm not happy, but about doing that, but. It does raise some questions, you know? Um, the questions that it raises to me is like, what is spooking the commercial contractors to, to either A, go at it alone, or B, you know, merge with other partners? Like, what what is causing this? 
And the one thing that I could really kind of think of in my head that's causing this problem is that the Low Earth Orbit Development Program is underfunded. It's probably that. Yeah, if I had to guess. Um, I, I think that has something to do with it. It's probably... Sorry. It's probably something to do with that. I think if, if the commercial partners for the commercial low Earth orbit development program are doing stuff like this in the early phases of Cleod, that, that, that means they think that NASA's not taking it seriously or it's not, it's not good enough, which it, it's, not, it, it's not concrete enough to, um, to pursue by yourself or it's too much of a financial risk. A loss of customer demand, potentially. Why would they think that if NASA's the customer, Sumo, right? That tells me that Cleod is a mess. That's what that tells me. But, once again, I could be... Could be pulling that one out of my tail. I mean, I don't know. Once again, I don't like kind of filling in the blanks just because you didn't get all the information. You know... So that's what's going on. I'm not 100% sure exactly what that means. It's kind of too early to tell. So there's a little bit more space news here. I mean, if they're going to repurpose them to commercial stations as well, they might as well be budgeting for some of that. Yeah. True that. So here, the next thing that we got here is uh, Relativity is working on their test stands. Their brand new test stands down at Stennis for testing engines. That's a, a, a flame bucket right there with a, um, a cooling system basically built in. If you look, the flame bucket, the flame deflector is just a bunch of pipes that are all kind of welded together. And those pipes, they'll run water through to divert and cool the rocket exhaust so it doesn't melt the deflector. It's actually really neat. Yeah, this is a twin cell test stand. There's going to be another one, another diverter right there, I think, if I saw the plans correctly. Cool. The road to a full engine mission duty cycle is filled with new history in the making. Humans for scale. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Last note on the neutron thing. Do you think that was the stage two tank with a common dome or two tanks inside? Uh, erudite, I'm not sure. Well, five five meter. That, I think that's the second stage. I think, you usually start with the second stage. The voices win. What the? F okay, Hell Hydra, I got that. What? What the what the balls is this? Graphite epoxy tanks. Oh. Um, I, Why? 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 Why would you do this? Just uh, if you extend the tanks on the rocket a little bit, then you don't need the entire 225 at all. And then you just take this, put it up there, take the wings off, mass savings, and boom, you got a rocket. I, I don't, I don't understand people's obsession with straddle launching. Straddle launching is dumb. 
if you're trying to move anything above a shoebox into space. This thing is calling for 50,000 50, pounds, so 25 metric tons payload. Are you nuts? Why would you do this? Now, if the answer is because it's cool, okay, yeah, absolutely. But there's no practical use for this. Heck, there isn't even a practical use of a straddle launch plane that launches a shoebox-sized payload into space. What, what makes you think your people are going to use this? I have the PDF. Do you want it? No, I don't. I do not. I left my graphite epoxy tanks in my other pants. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, Dizzy, that makes sense. But EJ, cool is important. The space shuttle is cool. Okay? And it it's less of a death trap than this thing. Yeah, 50.6 thousand pound. K KLB. All systems, I'm proficient in Imperial and that, I, I look at that and go, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? 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 That f Dude, even me, I'm like, that feels wrong. <laughs> Kill a pound! Ow. Ow. I'm all right. I'm all right. Oh, I'm sorry. My fault. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We're good. Anyway, you need to get a better chair, dude. It's not. It's not the chair. It's my back. Decided to not back anymore. Here, take a look at this this picture that S Master took. This was yesterday at Starbase. You need a better back. Yeah. Yep. I, I don't hate this. I don't hate it. That's a, a vacuum raptor that's being towed by a cyber truck. Can we mount it on the back of the cyber truck? I, I I asked Sean when he took this photo yesterday, all system. I'm like, can we put the rocket engine on the truck? He's like, no, 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 it's towing it. I'm like, oh, that's good too. Yeah, that's close enough. Close enough. Yeah, our vac is, Raptor vacuum is a big motor. DLCs for a car, crazy. <laughs> Oh, boy. Why, though? Don't they have some 250s lying around? They did it so people can take pictures of it, dude. Like, for the publicity, maybe? I mean... <laughs> that that's a pretty cool picture I'm not gonna lie that's pretty cool that's a render right no no that's that's real that's uh well that's fair I didn't know it was an actual photo op well I mean cyber cyber truck has a camera mounted on it see see the camera mounts so this is some type of publicity, dude. Some type of SpaceX. They're probably making a video or something. 305. It does look like a render, though. It's, it's, it's crazy. That, that, that looks like something you'd see, like, as weird computer graphics in, like, an, like an old episode of, like, SG-1 or something. Need more ways to get Cybertruck hype? Dude, I'll say this. I'll say this to this day. I still think Cybertruck looks cool. I just, I don't like the back. The back looks weird. The front, though, looks really, the front looks like a warthog, man. You know, Elon told me to get in the warthog and crush your head like a tomato can.
Is that nozzle extension regenerative or ablative? Well, Builder, do some... Think about it for a second. Starship, fully reusable launch system. If you have a fully reusable launch vehicle, what, what, what would you do? Regenerative or ablative nozzles? So, I mean, I see the pipe, but the structure of it looks odd. It's regen. It's regen because you would want regenerative so you don't have to change the nozzles after every flight, right? Because all these hotels have bomb detectors, right? That's actually a structural piece right there for what it's worth. That's a strut. It's not a pipe. That, though... They're, they're using regenerative cooling not via like flowing propellants through the nozzle. See how they have one pipe that goes down into a manifold right here? It's film cooled. It's film cooled from a tap off if I'm looking at that correctly. Please for the love of God check page 14. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Yes, but you still need a license plate on the trailer. That's right. Yep. Hey, they're in full compliance there. Also, I could really use a trailer just like that. That would be really nice. Yeah, a trailer just like that. How much how much do you think a trailer like that would run? What the f Twenty nine ninety five government surplus. Yeah, I got to find one in the garage. I just got the tow hitch hooked up on my truck. I got to wire up the trailer brakes, but <clears throat> easy peasy. There's a heat exchanger and an intake on this, and it takes the atmosphere, and it, yeah, it makes liquid oxygen. There's ISRU built into the airplane, and it's, it takes intake air and makes the locks for the vehicle. Because, you know, how, how complicated do you want this? How complicated... Yeah, get this off the screen. Just, 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 just. Apparently we have another spotting of retirement airplanes. Uh, I only see one airplane here. What are you talking about? KC-135s aren't retired. They're close. They aren't retired. They're being replaced by KC-46s. Am I missing something?
There's only one plane on the screen. You see three planes? There's only there's only a KC-135. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> I see nothing. You see two UFOs. The distortions are caused by some camera lenses and some swamp gas reflected off of Venus or something. So this is a picture that was taken. What does that watermark say? Gavin Douglas? Yeah, there's F-117s, I guess. Uh, so technically those planes are retired, but also... How many things wrong can you point out with this? <laughs> what the what the frick <laughs> what, what the hell <laughs> what the what the frick Ural Airlines landing. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> That's really funny, dude. Oh, look at the freaking motor. It's a freaking dirt bike engine. That's awesome. That's, I mean, hey. I mean, that, hey, <laughs> don't go above a thousand feet, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real good way to get killed. <laughs> yeah, it's a death trap. I mean, uh, all right. <laughs> it's a freaking dirt bike engine. That's awesome. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. You had some spottering issues. And I was still occasionally having problems getting engine power to get enough lift. Come to find out, to help your brother, I need a stuck float valve. And it's because I, I never actually fully cleaned the carburetor. Oh. But I kind of just opened up. I kind of just opened up the top and the sides. And blew some car cleaner in there. <laughs> oh my god. So after we get this cleaned up, I think we'll be airworthy. Wait. Is this a hang glider? It's a hang glider with a dirt bike engine attached to it. Hey, FAA, as long as he stays basically right at the tree line vanguard, not breaking any laws, dude. You can do that. Sure, why not? Don't go above a thousand feet though. You go above a thousand feet, you're gonna start you're gonna have some problems. 
this is where the engine started to stutter, and I had to bring her down. And I noticed that th th this kid's flying over the, over his farm. He's flying over farmland, so there's plenty of places to land in case this happens. Actually, not the stupidest person around. Like, if you're flying over those trees, that's where I'd be like, hmm. You got a new propeller on the front. Then I made this... And then I custom made this expansion chamber. The welds don't really have to look all that pretty. I mean, it's just an airplane. <laughs> so we learned a few things from today's flight. We start off with a full expansion chamber, but I was not happy with the performance. So I just cut off the tip to see if that... <laughs> what the frick? <laughs> it marginally, uh, so then I cut it here and I, it still didn't do it. So I just completely removed it. So all that video had literally no exhaust on it. And the exhaust is blowing in your face, by the way. <laughs> And I was actually able to achieve extremely high RPM. Depending on which RPM gauge I look at, it's uh, I was getting up to like 6,000. And the max recommended for the propellers is 4. So I'm going to have to double check the my tachometers. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> hey, as long as it's as long as he's staying below a thousand feet and he's on his own land, hey, have at it, dude. That's pretty that's pretty cool, but yeah, don't don't go try to land that at an airport. Someone you can get really mad. <laughs> For what it's worth, uh, it's not an endorsement. Don't try to make your own airplane unless you really know what you're doing. <laughs> like the float, the float being stuck. Just okay. Hey FX, what's up, man? Forty-eight month resub. Good evening. That little freaking dirt bike engine. I can't believe it. I can't believe that thing has enough power to do it. That's a little... Look at that. Look at that tiny little thing, man. I... Hey, as long as... If dude's on his own land and not going above regulated... Or going into regulated airspace. Whatever. I mean... Yeah, there's a lot of things that can go wrong here, but uh, you can tell this dude has too much free time. Never, ever underestimate a farmer when you're not harvesting. There's downtime on farms. That's why farms usually have more than one way to make money other than crops. But never underestimate the ingenuity of a farmer, ever. I love, what is that? A, what is that? Is that, a, is that like a barometer or something? What the hell is that thing? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Dude, it works though. That's, that's pretty cool, man. But yeah, I wouldn't recommend people do this. It's probably not a good idea, but that's pretty funny, dude. Temp gauge, fuel meter, up the volume and hear his voice. So we learned a few things from today's flight. We started off with a full expansion chamber, but I was not happy with the performance, so I just cut off the tip to see if that helped. It didn't, it helped marginally. Uh, so then I cut it here, and I still didn't do it. So then I just completely removed it, so all that flight video had literally no exhaust on it, and I was actually able to achieve extremely high RPMs. 
Depending on which RPM gauge I look at, it's uh, I was getting up to like 6,000, and the max recommended for the propellers is four, so I'm gonna have to double check the, the my tachometers. I had some sputtering issues, and I was still occasionally having problems getting enough power to get enough lift. Come to find out, with the help of my brother, I had a stuck float valve, and uh, it's because I never actually fully cleaned the carb. I just kind of opened up the top and the sides and blew some carb cleaner in there. So after we get this cleaned up, I think we'll be airworthy. That's Midwest, all systems. That's Midwest. I'd say Iowa, like probably Eastern Iowa or Southern Illinois. Farmers, man. Everybody and their mums is packing around here. Like who? Farmers. Who else? Farmers' mums. Not southern Illinois to northern. Could be Iowa, southern Minnesota, southern Wisconsin, somewhere. That's my guess. Somewhere around there. That's not Michigan. That's not. That's not. That's not. That's not Michigan. That's too far east. Central Illinois or Indiana. Notters. You're thinking Dakotas, Missouri? It's definitely Midwest, dudes. Yeah, but I don't know. That's pretty funny, man. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Maybe it's Lower Montana. Could be. Last, please. I don't think that's an accent. The titles, though. I see them, Jib. Ever see someone calculate engine impulse via weight of graph paper? Okay. find the impulse I need to find the area under the curve. Now an easy way to do that is just trace the graph. <laughs> He's not wrong. So I need to find the mass of a known area. Yeah, look we're bored. Yeah I know. <laughs> that, it'll work. It, that will work. Oh, That's pretty good. That, no it'll do it. That's that's calculus. That's calculus in analog form. <laughs> that's pretty good, man. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's, dude, that's calc. Finding areas above and below a corner. That's, that, that is, yeah, freaking calculus on paper. This piece here I need to. I'll link up the video for you guys so you guys can check the rest, but I have a thing about looking at... I know it's Cody's lab, but I don't know Cody, so I'm not going to watch the whole video because that's a dick move. Do you see anything weird with this jet? Yeah. Yeah, we... Yeah. I'm too dumb. Explain what he's doing. He's trying to find... He's trying to figure out the efficiency of... He's trying to figure out the efficiency of the rocket engine that he's making, Squall. Now, normally you'd plot out a curve, right? And you need to figure out... Long story short, you need to figure out the area below that curve from the, from the zero line to the curve, right? And you use calculus to do that. We've done that on stream before. We used calculus to program the SRBs on my space shuttle. We did the exact same thing. That's why I'm familiar with this. Cody did it by plotting it out on a piece of paper and then cutting out the piece of paper. And then... I think, Health, as you said, he used the weight of the paper to do it, which is... All right. Yeah, he, he weighed the paper. It, it'll work. That'll work. It's a weird way of doing it, but that, that that's basically analog calculus. <laughs> that's like the liberal arts calculus. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but that, that's it. It's funny that that will work. 
It, 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 and I'm guessing it worked. I'm guessing he did it. That, that was actually pretty damn accurate. Is that Apollo math? No. No, they didn't. No. <laughs> if you know the grams per centimeter squared, it's easy to solve. Yeah, that's actually, yeah. That's, calculus will solve that for you if you know what to do. You'll figure out surface area below the curve. But, yeah, cutting it out on a, cutting it out on a piece of paper works. Nice shirt, even though the Patriots are in a hole black hole. Yeah. Yay, integrals. I found myself at an auto auction today. They had a clean 97 F250 sold for 10k with 5,000 original miles. 5,000. 5,000. Police. Is that Apollo math? No. 5,000. 10 grand is a steal. That's a steal for a truck with 5,000 miles on the clock, man. That's, uh... Five kilomiles. Well, they, they signed... Patriots signed J.C. Jackson today, Jim, which is pretty cool because... Yeah. Anyway... I had to ask because that seemed way too low. If I had 10K, I would have bought it. I mean, Spoon, the prices of those trucks aren't going down, that's for sure. But that's not necessarily because they're super rare. I mean, between 93 and 90, 90, 98 for the 250 and the 350, Ford made like a million of those. A million trucks. But also one with 5,000 miles. Yeah, 10K is dude, totally worth it. But the prices are appreciating because everything is expensive nowadays. Because Anyway, here. Look at this picture. So that is a... That's a Tupolev. Tupolev 154, I think. It, uh... What'd you do? Did you, what... We doing some ejector seat testing here, or...? You have a DJ. You have an O2 Tacoma with 8,200 miles on it. Uh, yeah, that's probably worth some money. Uh, is that? Are they um, testing an ejector seat or something? Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. It. Yeah. That's the bathroom flush. I think he. I think he. I think he flushed the wrong flusher. Discovery, go at throttle. Wait, is there somebody in that, or is that a dummy? Not a thing. Six month reset. Thank you. <laughs> Joe, DJ Jovi and Jovi wants to know. You want to you know, sell it? <laughs> Dude, that the taco. An O2 with 8,200 miles on it. That's people. Will, people want those. Calling them a dummy isn't very nice. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, the, the anthropomorphic test device. Spherical. I mean, I, I think that might be a crash test dummy. Either that or it's just a dummy. Or an anthropomorphic test, test device. E either way, yeah, e ejector seats. Um, back problems. Actually, fun fact, you can only eject from a plane so many times before you don't, you, you can't be a pilot no more. You, your spine can only be compressed so much before ejecting from a plane. If you do it too many times, you, you yeah, your spine will be like, hmm, what's the word I'm looking for? No! You know? That's an F5 cockpit strapped to a TU-154 Stability to test an ejector seat with a dude in it from Iran. <laughs> but if you have to eject from a plane many times, were you a really good pilot in the first place? Good point. <laughs> good point. It's one hell of a Taco Bell ad. Yes. We, 
We have superior toilet. Superior toilet. Our flush system is superior to Western counterparts. It, it flush so hard it launch you out of plane. Is better. Next heats spine specifications. Yep. How it feels to chew five cups. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> Yeah, Shaw, test pilots, but test pilots usually don't get paid. They get paid to test the airplane, not eject out of it. Yeah, you know, it's not, it's not like a normal occurrence. Oh. Freaking die, dude. It's killing me. I'm, try, I'm trying to put on a brave face. I feel like I'm being stabbed. The, is that the AFRL thing, Phil? All right, let's let's see what we got here. The Bristol 188 was a Mach 2 research aircraft constructed from stainless steel and part of the contemporary bomber supersonic transport effort in this RAE, RAE Bedford WT test. Wedge inlets have replaced the axisymmetric conical geometry actually used. Forward center pressure movement likely made this non non starter. Uh okay. DJ is that Oh hello. It's so perfect. Bro! Dude, it's, where'd you get, how did you, how did you get this? I'm just, my highest offer I had was 18K. Yeah. Keep going up. Don't. Up. You have it on BAT? You have it, it's on Bring a Trailer? Cool. How many miles? 8,200, man. Perfect, but it's a taco. Never let it see salt. Oof. Just asking to be mall crawled. <laughs> see, you, you know, Fanny, you know, my truck, the 97, has, has 174,000 miles on it. So, you know, I don't need to worry about, you know, beating the snot out of it because somebody already did it. We're way past the pristine point with that thing, you know, you know what I'm saying? We're, so I don't have to feel bad. That's that's why I uh, don't buy low mileage ve vehicles or something. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Oh yeah. Also, did you see that Northrop Grumman joined Lockheed Martin Voyager Space and Airbus? Yeah, I we talked about that, Phil. All side. Uh, between what we've heard with Orbital Reef and what we saw with Northrop Grumman, all signs are pointing to the Cleod program being a colossal frick-up. The only thing that's going to scare these companies into doing weird stuff like this is uncertainty. And Northrop Grumman has said that they are uncertain of a, of a sustainable contract, operative word, sustainable contract in the future. Like they're worried about having a stable anchor point. They're worrying about worried about having a, a space station up there to send NASA astronauts to that NASA can commit to. That tells me that Cleod is a cluster frick. That's what that that's what that's telling me. Blue Origin keeps posting orbital reef updates though. I don't think I, I think Blue is still on board. I don't think the them splitting with SNC is anything. Grab. I think that that is all based off hearsay, dude. Easy. Just start an internet satellite constellation. You need to get one of those strap-on heat pads for your back. Game changer. I spent probably about six hours yesterday, silly, on the heating pad. I, I'm kind of getting to the point where I, I'm kind of starting to worry a little bit because it still has. It, usually, when you tweak your back like that, it stops, but it hasn't stopped. 
I don't know what I did, dude. I hurt something back there. This is normal. What is this? Ah, uh, we've seen this. Yeah, we've seen it before. Uh, I'll show it again. We, we watched this on Space News the other day. So who's this? Oop, no, no, don't click on that, jeez. This is from Combat Lairjet, and the original shot was from The Hot Shot Wake Up. Wait for it. Wait for it. You'll see it lurking in the clouds there. Wait for it. Up, up, up. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Yo! <laughs> that's, that's still crazy, man. What are you nuts? <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> Damn! Oh, jeez. That's awesome. Yeah, we, 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 Forge, we saw that on Space News the other day. Somebody else linked it. Dude, you see that? Ow. You see that, dude? It's crazy. The wink, dude, it was close, Apocalypse. It was, it was close. It was very close. Not a crop duster. No, no, not at all. That's much too low. He rolled a bit to miss the treetops, and he probably needed to. Can you imagine? I, I Alex, do you remember the last time we watched a, a fire? Actually, no. I refused to show that footage on stream. Ow. This is really getting bad. Hold on. Ugh. The, uh, the plane that... The plane that went down, right, and the wing clipped the tree, and it started boomeranging around... You, did you ever see that footage? I'm not showing it on stream because nobody survived that. <laughs> you need a heating pad to help your back. I need a lot of things to help my back, Clayton. Standing up like this is probably good. A 380 at Heathrow. What's this? Heathrow. From EV Aviation. Damn! Damn! That's cool. That's cool. Do you have a regular schedule and time for space news? Um, Jax, right now it's kind of up in the air. Um, I think I'm going to get back to doing space news at 4 o'clock Eastern. Yeah. Look, a flying row of houses. Indeed. That's not abnormally low. That plane is just huge. Yeah, precisely. Yep. A380 landing at Heathrow. You think it's Gatwick? Why, oh, mate? You think, you think it's Gatwick, mate? I don't, I don't, I don't think it's Gatwick. I, I think it's Heathrow because it says it in the name. Looking forward to that? Yeah, I, I want to get back to Kerbal and Space News and... We'll mix in the other games as we go. Actually, I think I want to play KSP tomorrow. I want to get, I want to just make sure that I can still fly the shuttle correctly. That is a huge freaking plane. Jeez, that plane is gigantic. <laughs> All right. Ready for the ocean. Oh, you dick. You dick. Vega's ready to fly VV-23. It's expected to launch from Guiana Space Center on the 6th of October at 10.36 p.m. local time. With two main Earth observation sa satellites, Theos and, what is that, Formosat? Yeah, Formosat. Look at him. They're side by side. So that's, uh, that's Vega. Just Vega, not Vega C. Vega C has, um, 
some problems. The, the C in Vega C, they got confused. All right, it's Vega C like the letter C, not Vega dash S E A. C like the, the rocket doesn't work and goes into the water. Yeah, that's probably, I think they misunderstood. It's probably something got lost in translation somewhere. Do we know what time Elon's speaking tomorrow? Oh, oh yeah, he's doing IAC tomorrow. Uh, I gotta stand up again. <sighs> okay. Um, I don't know. I, I thought, yeah, we're, we've been getting IAC information today, dude. Yeah, I'm just going to stand back here for a little bit. I'm no back expert, but I hear buying more project cars is healthy for your back. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, it's doing the, there's a, uh, There's actually a full rear end for a Camaro sitting on my front porch right now. And it's on a pallet, and I have no idea how I'm going to get it to the garage. The, uh, the gravel, or the driveway going back to the garage is gravel, and it's on a pallet. Uh, <laughs> rent a forklift delegated to friendly neighbors it's starship update time don't miss elon musk's keynote at iec 2023 iec will live stream it on their x account x account Tomorrow morning, October 5th at 1345 UTC. So that's 145 UTC. Oh, shoot. That's in the morning. That's... <sighs> Hang on. Hang on a minute. Ah, 1345 UTC. Nine forty. All right. Well, I'm I'm not gonna miss that. So. Go get some guys from Home Depot. Yeah, I'll figure it out. I I was thinking, the ninety seven, the pickup truck and an engine crane will probably probably do it. But yeah. Gravel driveway is bad for most forklifts. Skid steer is better. Plus, you said you wanted to move dirt. I like the way you think, Gaw. Yep. So, yeah, okay, so 945 tomorrow. Well, if that's the case, fellas, I'm, I should probably get some rest. Um, ow, okay. How about this? A 359 doing what looks like a combat climb. This is, it sucks. This sucks. And this is crap on anybody. What is this? Wow, he's going up quick. Come on, son. Get it up. Flip your neck. Ah, oh, big jet. This guy's cool. Wow. Blimey, what's going on there? Flip your neck. Um. Yeah, he kind of like went up, went down, went up again. Was that, was that? Level out now, but that was a very weird, um. Uh, tailwind, tailwind maybe? We, we saw this when we were looking at footage of a 737 the other day, and it, it looks like that could be tailwind, unless, I mean, I'd have to see the guy's flaps. The flaps are down, they're in the right position. Uh, 
It's all right. Could be tailwind, could be light, could be light load, but the preliminary rotation. So the rotation that happens right here is. I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily a light load. See that right there? See the see the adjustment with the elevons or the elevators? That's yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway. All right, guys. Well, if I'm going to get up early tomorrow, I'm going to go lie down and sit on the heating pad for the next, like, couple hours. Wait for the graph, dude. You're killing me. You're, you're, you're killing me. I'm suffering over here. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> you're freaking killing me right now. Where's your graph? side so you guys can see the fun part. At a neon, I had to go get a physical to get relief, man. They had to do exercises every day to help it. I also changed my mattress to be way more stiff. Yeah, I already have a stiff mattress, dude. All right, cool. I gotta, I gotta stop. I gotta stop. This is getting, this is getting out of hand. I'm gonna go rest the back. I should be good for tomorrow. I'm definitely better today than I was yesterday. So, yeah, it's just, I mean, that's all you can do. You just rest it up, and that's it. That's why back pain sucks. Because when it comes, when it comes at you, it's just gonna ruin everything. Like I can't move anything. I can't can't lift things up. It's really annoying. Last post, friend. I'm leaving. I'm lo I'm, I'm leaving. What time is Elon? It's nine forty-five. So I'll I'll try to be on here around nine thirty, something like that. Uh, we'll yeah we'll we'll. Watch that, and we'll um, watch that, and we'll discuss it. And then, by the time noon time rolls around, I guarantee you we'll jump into some KSP, or maybe maybe we get some new information tomorrow. Maybe we'll screw around with a starship build. Yeah, Vanguard, it sucks. Back pain is pretty bad. Just get a warm pad and try and rest. Yeah, yeah, it's not fun. All right, guys, I will see everybody tomorrow. Uh, early for the ISC coverage. Watch together. It'll be fun. Um, actually, wait a minute. Was that rocket launch supposed to be tonight? Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah. Wait. No. Yes? It is tonight. Starlink. Oh. Look. It's Starlink or the IAC coverage. I could usually do both of those things. But not not right now. <laughs> and stream from the couch. <laughs> I think I'm gonna rest up for the IAC stuff. We've all seen Starlinks before. Here, here, here you go. Preliminary supersonic retro propulsion. There you go. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. I'll try to be on probably around 9, 9.30, somewhere in between there, okay? I'll see you guys then. Thank you very much for watching, and my uh, advice for you is don't get old. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you.